number 33. Stand up and bless the Lord. We sing this to a different tune that's written here, so don't let that throw you, but it's a familiar tune. Let's all stand together. Number 33. call to worship from Psalm 84. Psalm 84. Uh, thank you for your prayers for this uh, past weekend. It was, uh, uh, it was an enjoyable trip for me. I trust that it was profitable. Um, and um, I was very grateful to know that you were here praying for me and that Robert and Michael were here faithful to the gospel had a chance to listen to both those messages yesterday and was so encouraged and so grateful for these these men. <clears throat> uh, before we read uh, our, our scripture for tonight, I'll give you an update on Brian. Um, as I understand it, the uh, regulations for being approved for a transplant are very rigor rigorous. Um, a lot of details have to be uh, taken care of in, in order to create, I guess, a level playing field for those who are looking for a transplant. And that's what Brian's going through right now. They have uh, expedited the procedures, but he still has some, some hoops to go through um, before he can get on the list. Um, if and when he gets on the list, he's high on the priority. Uh, ratings, so it could be the same day he gets on the list that a liver would be available. It could be um, a week or two, but uh, continue to pray. That's our hope. Uh, they seem to be, he's in great spirits. I know many of you have seen him. Um, um, he told me again today, he said, these people treat me like a king. <laughs> uh, so, uh, He's enjoying the, the TLC and thanking the Lord. He's just very, very grateful for, uh, for the Lord's uh, goodness toward him. And uh, I'm very thankful for him. He's watching tonight. So, <clears throat> Psalm 84, you have your Bibles open. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. My soul longeth, yea, even feigneth for the courts of of the Lord, my heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Our hope is that the Lord would create such a spirit in our hearts tonight. Um, I asked
asked Noah a few minutes ago how he's doing. He said, I need to hear about Christ. That's, that's, that's what this is saying. God's put it in my heart to want to hear the gospel, to need to hear the gospel. Yea, the sparrow hath found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will be still, comma, praising thee. (laughs) Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the ways of them who passing through the valley of Baca make it a well and rain also filleth the pools they go from strength to strength every one of them in Zion appeareth before God we come before the throne of grace to find help in our time of need and know that we are welcomed there and accepted in the beloved O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. This is the believer asking the Lord to look upon the face of the Lord Jesus Christ on my behalf. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. Now, don't get that turned around. It's not you will be blessed if you trust in him. If you trust in him, it's because you've been blessed. Let's, uh, Let's pray together. Our merciful Heavenly Father, we do come in the name of thy dear Son, thanking you that we have acceptance before thee, thanking you, Lord, that we have an advocate, a sin bearer, one who presents us perfect before thy presence. We thank you, Lord, for this place where we can come together and open thy word and join our hearts together in worship of thee. Lord, how we do pray that you would bless us. Bless us with thy presence. Bless us with the understanding that can only come by your Holy Spirit, enabling us to to see Christ, to rest in Christ, to rely upon him. Lord, we do pray that you would increase our faith. And we pray, Father, for those who are strangers to your grace, and we ask, Lord, that you would send your Holy Spirit in power and make them willing, cause them to come, We thank you for Brian. Thank you for the faith that you've given him. We ask, Father, that you would would provide for him healing to his body for our sakes. Lord, that, uh, that you would give to him this this miracle of life and enable us, Lord, to be able to to rejoice in your grace and in your mercy toward him to that extent. We thank you for the rejoicing that we have now in knowing that our sins have been put away and knowing, Lord, that you have nothing but good for your children and knowing that, that we have a place that's been prepared for us. We thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together again, number 229, 229. <clears throat>
Tell me the old, old story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. Tell me the story simply as to who story often, for I forget so soon. The early dew of morning has passed away at noon. Tell me the old, old story. Tell me the the story softly with earnest tones and grave. Remember I'm the sinner whom Jesus came to save. Tell me the story always if you would really be. In same old story when you have cause to fear that this world's empty glory is costing me too dear. Yes, and when that world's glory is dawning on my soul, tell me passage of scripture that the Lord has led me to try to preach from tonight is that old, old story. And it's so clear that uh, very little needs to be said about it. Um, if, uh, if you can't see the gospel in Isaiah chapter 4, then um, I would uh, encourage you to ask the Lord to have mercy on you. Open the eyes of my understanding, Lord. I, I want to be able to see Christ. It's so clear in this passage of Scripture. And I have read and studied Isaiah chapter 3 and tried to 
develop a message from the rest of that chapter and just wasn't able to. Uh, I know the gist of the chapter, that uh, the Lord is pronouncing judgment on those who would put their trust in anything other than Christ. That's the, that's the message. And the application of that message relates to a man-made religion. It rema- relates to free will, works religion, which is natural for man. But as I studied chapter 3 of Isaiah, I also saw, as we saw last Wednesday night from the first two verses of that chapter, that it relates to my old man. It relates to the man in me that cannot believe and the man that will suffer death one day. And I look forward to that day. I look forward to that day when, uh, when, when, when this corruptible will be made incorruptible and this mortal will be made immortal because there's something in me that cannot believe the gospel. And then there's another part of me that cannot not believe the gospel. And I'm so thankful for that. So Isaiah chapter 3, if you uh, get a chance to go back and, and read it, um, let me just uh, show you a couple of verses that summarize uh, this chapter. Verse 8, for Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen because their tongue And their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eye of his glory. Now that's the that's the gist of the whole chapter, and you can see how how the unregenerate man would provoke the eye of God's glory by believing that something that he does, some prayer that he prays, or some work that he performs would merit him favor with God. And, uh, and the Lord says, you've, you've provoked the eye of my glory. You've robbed me of my glory. You've taken to yourself that which belongs only to me. And I will not share my glory with another. And so you have nothing but the judgment and wrath of God to look forward to. And as I said, there's a, there's a part of every believer his old man that has that's never been able to believe and he's no less sinful uh, now than he's ever been he's he's nothing but sin that's all he is and that old man is well he's going to get what he deserves (laughs) he's going to be put back into the ground and uh and the lord is the lord is uh is showing us that in this, in this chapter. Look at verse 10 and 11 of that same chapter. Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Now here's to the child of God. Say ye to the righteous. And say ye to the new man. It shall be well with you. It shall be well with you. And you will eat the fruit of your doings. Because everything that the Lord Jesus Christ did, we did in him. That's my hope. Union with Christ. That his righteousness is my righteousness. He's called the Lord our righteousness. And we are called the Lord our righteousness. Say to the righteous, it shall be well with them. For they shall eat the fruit of their doings. (laughs) This matter of imputation was so real that the Lord Jesus Christ considered our sins to be his and suffered all the wrath of God and the shame for sin on Calvary's cross when God charged him with our sin. God made him sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so this matter of imputation is so real that as he is, so are we. In this world right now, say ye to the righteous, it shall be well with them. And whatever providential circumstances God ordains for us in this life while we're still in this flesh, that'll be good too. That'll be good too. I've got nothing but good for you. 
You know, we can look at every situation and every circumstance. I was telling somebody in Kentucky last weekend, I said, uh, they were talking about, you know, the, the candidates for president. And I said, well, whoever it is, it's going to be good for us. It's going to be good for us. I believe that with all my heart. It'll be good for God's people. That may not be good for the economy. It may not be good for the, uh, for the unbeliever. But everything's going to be good for us. Say ye to the righteous, it shall be good with them. They shall eat of the fruit of their doing. What the Lord is doing, he's doing for us. And it's all good. And verse 11, woe unto the wicked. As I said, this applies, this whole chapter applies to the, to the unbeliever in religion, in the world, and in me. Say ye to the wicked, woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. <laughs> the reward of what he's done. Everything we've placed our hands on in this world has been infected with sin. And one day, these hands are going to be put back in the ground. And that's going to be good. That's going to be good. <clears throat> now, in light of that, in light of that, we're in need of a word from God, a word of grace, a word of promise, a word of hope. We're in need of hearing the gospel. We're in need of knowing that how is it that it's going to be well? Lord, uh, this, this wickedness that's in me, this sin that, that does so easily beset me, this unbelieving flesh that, uh, that's strapped to my back, uh, Lord, what's my hope? What's my hope? And chapter 4, the Lord speaks peace to the hearts of his people. And my hope tonight is that the Holy Spirit will take his word and speak peace to our hearts. And in that day, now I've titled this message, This Is That Day right now and if the spirit of God is pleased to come in power and make us willing now will be the day of salvation now will be the accepted time and this will be that day now, Isaiah is prophesying of course of what's going to happen in the latter day the latter day you remember is the whole period of time between the first and second coming of Christ and so he's 700 years before the coming of Christ, he's, he's prophesying of what's going to happen in that day. That day's come, and that day is now. And so the Lord is speaking peace and hope and promise to the hearts of his people when he says, in light of the fact that the, Ill, that the wicked are going to be destroyed and uh, the righteous are going to be provided for, in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man. Now, you know the number seven is the number of perfection. It's uh, on the seventh day, God had finished his work and he rested. And this thing that we call a week repeats itself every seven days, doesn't it? It's a perpetual number. It's a number that represents the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all of God's elect. It's all those that he chose in the covenant of grace before the world began. It's, a, it's the women. It's the church. And seven women are going to go to one man. All Israel shall be saved. Not one will be lost. I'll not lose one of my sheep. All seven women. Every single one of them. The whole church and every member of the church is going to go to one man. The God man. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5. There is one God and one mediator between God and man. The man. 
the man, Christ Jesus, the Lord. He's, he's the man that we all flee to. We don't go anywhere else. We don't go to the law for salvation. We don't go um, to another man for salvation. We, there's no strength in man. There's no hope in our works. Um, when uh, the Lord is pleased to teach us the gospel, he causes every one of his bride, all seven of them, to flee in faith to one man. But I want you to notice what this woman says to her potential husband when she first comes to him. She says, we will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. Now in Exodus chapter 21 verse 10, God made provision in the law for those men who would violate his law by taking more than one wife. The Lord had always ordained one woman for one man for life. And uh, those who would have multiple wives, uh, God put a provision in his law for the protection of those other wives. And he said in Exodus chapter 21 that if a man takes a second wife or a third wife or however many wives he takes, he cannot show partiality towards any of his wives. He has to provide every one of them the same exact thing. The same exact thing. I'm sure that that was a deterrent for some men taking on more than one wife. But that was the law. The law was that whatever bread and whatever shelter and whatever provisions, you could not diminish those provisions, is what it says in Exodus chapter 21, for your second and third and multiple wives. It had to be exactly the same for every one of them. You could not show partiality. So these women are coming to their husband. And they're saying, we're not going to hold you to the law. We'll, we'll keep the law ourselves. We'll provide our own bread and our own water if you'll just let us have your name so that we can have this reproach taken away from us. You say, well, that's not how believers come to Christ, is it? In Acts chapter 2, when Peter first preached the gospel on the day of Pentecost, the scripture says that they were pricked in their hearts and said, men and brethren, here's what the people of Jerusalem said to Peter and to the disciples, men and brethren, what shall we do? In Acts chapter 16, you remember in the story of the Philippian jailer, when Paul and Silas were, the earthquake came and Paul and Silas were delivered and the Philippian jailer was going to kill himself and, and, uh, when, when Paul came out, he said, what must I do to be saved? In Mark chapter 10, the rich young ruler that Robert preached from on Sunday responded to the gospel by saying, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now here's the point. These seven women come to one man. <clears throat> And they say to this one man, we're not going to hold you to the law. We're going to keep the law. Only save us. And my understanding in my own experience and in the experience of others who first hear the gospel is that's how they come. That's how they come. What must I do? <laughs> I'm going to... Uh, let me, let me, you see, we're, we're by nature, by nature, we think that salvation is by works. By nature, we can't comprehend grace. By nature, we're, we're always thinking that there's something I've got to do. 
There's some law I've got to keep. There's some prayer I've got to pray. There's something that I need to avoid in my life. There's an aisle I need to walk. There's a baptistry I need to go through. There's something. There's a ceremony I need to perform. Surely, if I'm going to be saved, there's something that I have to do. And all seven women come to this one man and they say to him, we're not going to hold you to the law. We'll keep the law. Just save us. Just save us. Give us your name. Now we're going we're gonna to get past verse one, verse one. So don't don't worry too much yet. But that's the you see that's the natural that's the natural response, isn't it? And people, when they do hear the gospel. And we talk about the fact that there's nothing that you can do and that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness and he provides all the bread and all the water equally for all of his wives. He doesn't show partiality. He provides everything necessary for all seven women. They can't understand it. They just can't comprehend it. I I, I was... Talking to somebody just the other day, and I said, well, what, you know, what is your hope for salvation? And they said, well, to keep the commandments. Keep the commandments. That's what God requires. They said that, to keep the commandments. He said, well, how are you doing on that? Well, I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best. That's just the natural, unless, unless the Lord is pleased to open the eyes of our understanding and give us faith. In Christ, that's the way we all think. And that's the way we all come. And the Lord has to grant us repentance. You know what repentance is. We saw that last Wednesday night from verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3. It's a changed mind. We've got to have our minds changed. We just naturally think that, that, that salvation is by works. God has to change our mind. What did they want? They wanted his name. Jeremiah chapter 23. His name shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah said, can you? And Jeremiah chapter 33 says, and she shall be called Jehovah said, can you? And in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel, I think it is, um, the scripture says that, that she will now call her husband Ishi, which means husband. And no longer will she call him Bali, which means Lord. So she's not going to come cringing before him. She's going to embrace him in love as her husband. How many pictures of that we see in the Song of Solomon where this wife is, is, uh, is looking for her beloved and uh, the affection that the bride has with her husband. And all the way through to the book of Revelation, what do we read of? The lamb, the lamb, the, the, the uh, wedding feast of the lamb, where we're all seated together at our husband's table, and he's providing for us everything necessary for the full enjoyment of his grace. And Hosea, Hosea chapter 2 is where that, that she shall call his name Ishi, not uh, Bali. And then the, Hosea goes on to say, I will allure her. You remember what Gomer did in, in forsaking her husband. And, and Hosea did not give up on her. He continued to pursue her and drew her to himself and allured her and won her over with his affection and with his love. Look back with me to Isaiah chapter 4. And in that day, seven women, that's the whole church, that's all, all of God's elect, shall take hold of one man. And she'll say to him, if you'll make me your wife, I'll provide my own bread, my own water, my own clothing, 
Just take away the reproach of my sin. Save my soul. And I'll do whatever is necessary. Verse 2. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ is called uh, the, the stem that grows from the root of Jesse. He's called the branch. You remember when John the Baptist came preaching and the scripture says that John said the axe has been laid to the root of the tree. In other words, national Israel is about to be cut down. And from that stump is going to spring forth uh, the, the branch, the root of Jesse, and he's going to produce fruit. And... Um, and there's what he and and it's going to be beautiful. It's not going to be like that old self-righteous works lawmongering religion of uh, of of Israel. It's going to be a a religion of grace. It's not going to be one that's going to require the wife to provide for herself anything. He's going to keep the law for her. And 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 the branch is going to be is going to be Beautiful. Turn to me to uh, Zechariah. Towards the end of the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 6. And look with me at verse 12. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, and he will grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne And he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. He's going to do it. This is the beautiful branch. This is the one who gets all the glory. So this wife comes saying, what must I do to be saved? Surely there's some law. Surely there's something that I can do to earn favor with God. Surely there's something I can, I, I can, I can avoid or I can practice. And you know, that's just that's just the natural mind. And uh, then she looks and she sees the branch of the Lord to be beautiful and glorious. Verse chapter four, Isaiah verse two, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and. Uh, comely. Now the natural man sees no beauty in him that we should desire him. According to Isaiah chapter 54, we we look at him and we think, well, you know what? He, He doesn't, he's not beautiful. He's not comely. He's not glorious. He, he's, he, he's, he doesn't get, he doesn't get all the glory. Um, so the Lord does a work of grace and now he's beautiful and glorious and excellent and comely. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 4 says that he has a name that is more excellent than the name of all the angels. In Hebrews chapter 8 verse 6, the scripture says that his ministry is more excellent than the ministry of Moses. And Abel being a type of the Lord Jesus Christ makes it clear in Hebrews chapter 11 that his sacrifice was more excellent than Cain's. Cain brought the works of his hands and Abel brought the blood sacrifice of the lamb. The Lord Jesus Christ is the excellent one. He gets, he, God has given him all preeminence and here's the here's the the church coming to the one man saying we'll we'll eat our own bread we won't obligate you to the law we'll keep we'll keep our part of the law for us just save our souls here's a person who's got a desire to be saved but they don't know what salvation's about 
They think it still has something to do with their works. And in that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel, the elect. Not for everybody. Not for everybody. The natural man's still going to say, I'm not going to obligate you to the law. I'll keep the law for myself. But I still need you to save me. Isn't that, what, isn't that the thoughts of religion? We need Jesus. We need to be saved. The shame of our sin is evident. But this matter of law keeping, we'll, we'll take care of that ourselves. We just need him to put his approval on our efforts to keep the law. And it shall come to pass. And it shall come to pass. It shall come to pass. <laughs> Have you escaped? You know, we were prisoners of war, weren't we? The scripture says that the gates of hell shall not be able to prevail against it. And that God will take those who, who are... Um, in bondage and make them in bondage to himself, he'll come down into the very pits of hell and bring his children out. We, we lost the battle when we stood, Michael, with our father Adam and raised our fist to God. We died. We died. And we need the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Spirit of God through the ministry of the gospel to come into the prison and set us free. You know, I, there's been on the news recently a couple of prison breaks in the nation. And I was thinking about them today, and they were, they were as the result of an inside job. There was somebody that, that worked in the prison that actually provided them the resources that they needed to get out. I don't remember the result of that, but I remember that, seeing that on the news. And... Uh, and our being delivered from prison was an inside job. <laughs> you know, the Lord came into the prison and, uh, and, and took down the gates and set us free, came to set the prisoner free. And it shall come to pass, verse 3, that he that is left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called Holy. Holy? <laughs> yep. I'm so thankful for that. It should be called holy. <laughs> he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. He that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified. That's the, that's the word holy. That's the word holy means to be sanctified, to be set apart. He that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are all as one, whereby he is not ashamed to call them his brethren. She should be called holy. Now God's speaking. God's going to look at me and call me holy? If I'm in Christ, he is. See, this, this thing of marriage in the Old Testament, you know, people read the Old Testament and they think, well, that was just a male chauvinistic culture where the women didn't have any rights. And it's a gospel message. The, the woman was completely dependent upon marriage with her husband to be, for her to provide anything for her in this world. That's, that's the gospel. The Lord established the economy of Israel in order, to, in order to declare and illustrate the gospel. She shall be called holy, even everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem. Now, when were we written among the living in Jerusalem? When God etched our names in the covenant of grace, the Lamb's book of life, before time ever began. 
whosoever was not found in the, in the book of life was cast in to the pit of fire. Every one, every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion. That's my hope. I'll separate your sin from you as far as the east is from the west. I'll wash you of your sins and remember them no more. No more. All to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Look at it. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion. How do I know that I've been washed? How do I know? Because I really do believe that everything about me is filth. I believe that. I didn't used to believe that. I used to think that the only sin problem I had was some bad behavior that, 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 that smote my conscience from time to time and things that I made, you know, rededications and renewals. But now I know, I know that everything about me before God is filth. I can say with Job, I am vile. I have no clean flesh on my body. I've got no righteousness. My righteousnesses are as filthy rags before God. I'm going to say this Sunday, but I'll say it again tonight. Last week, I got a call Sunday morning when Wayne got here and found out that the offering box had been broken into. Somebody pried that door open right there, came in, broke the offering box, looking for money, I'm sure drug money. And I, and I thought, you know, um, Whoever did that unconscionable act, breaking into a church and stealing money from a church, certainly needs to be forgiven. No one would deny that. Everybody would say, yeah, that's that's sin, that's wrong, uh, and that person needs forgiven. No less than you and I need to be forgiven when we put money in the box. Every time we make an offering, Oh, Lord, why can't I trust you with more of what you've given me? Why why am I so bound to material things? Why? Why, why, do, I, why do I have any thought in, in giving this offering other than I'm an unprofitable servant? Why do, I, why do I entertain the idea that I'm doing something good? In me that is in my flesh. The fact that I put it in the offering box makes it vile. It makes it a sin. It makes it something that, well, it makes it something I need to be forgiven for. How do I know if I'm elect? Because the Lord has washed away my filth. He's made me clean in the Lamb's book, in the Lamb's blood. Uh, when John saw the, the saints in glory in Revelation and their robes were washed white in the Lamb's book of life, in the, in the blood of the Lamb, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. When did he forgive me? Did he forgive me when I came and begged forgiveness? Did he forgive me when I came and said, just make me one of your wives and I'll provide for myself? Did he forgive me then? No, the scripture says that he forgave us in judgment and in burning. When did that happen? When God Almighty looked down from heaven and he saw your sins and my sins on the Lord Jesus Christ and he was forced by his holy nature to cut off his own son. 
He couldn't have anything to do with his son when he saw our sin. And the fire of God's wrath fell from heaven and consumed the sacrifice, even as the sacrifice quenched the fire. The judgment of God fell on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the burning wrath of God's fury fell upon the Lord Jesus Christ. That's my hope. That's my hope. I've got... I've got no righteousness but the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of the flaming fire by night. For upon all the glory shall be a defense. Upon everything that is above shall be. You see that word defense? Perhaps you have it in the margin of your Bible. I have it in mine. It's the word covering. Covering. Upon her glory shall be a covering. What is the covering? It's the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. When I see the blood, I'll pass by you. It's the only thing that hides our sins from the view of God. And so he says, in every place, I'm going to provide... You think about those Israelites in the wilderness. I don't know, Michael, I think you brought this up Sunday morning. Um, The pillar of fire by night providing them not only warmth in the cold desert, but light in the darkness. And then the pillar of smoke by day. Uh, I mean, you would have cooked out there in in that desert. And every single day was a cloud covered day. (laughs) The Lord, the Lord protected them from the sun by day and uh, the darkness by night. And so he does for all his people. Here we are wandering through the dry desert of this world. And the Lord said, in every place, I'm going to provide for them light in their darkness. And I'm going to provide for them shade in the heat of their trials and troubles and persecution. And there shall be a tabernacle, verse 6, for a shadow in the daytime from the heat and for a place of refuge and for a covert from storm and from rain. I'm going to provide a tabernacle. The Lord Jesus Christ is that tabernacle. If we looked at the Old Testament tabernacle, every part of it, every part of it from the from the badger skin to the one door that came in to the to the columns to the to the uh, the the showbread to the uh, the lavers and the place of sacrifice and the holies of holies and the everything everything in that tabernacle pointed to Christ and the scripture says that the Lord Jesus Christ was made flesh and he tabernacled among us And what he's telling us here is that he's still doing that. He's tabernacling. He is the pillar of fire by day, by night. He is the shadow by day. And he's the covert. He's the place where we go and find our our hiding from the storms. The storm of God's wrath and storm of God's judgment that's going to come against our sin, uh, come against the sins of this world one day. We don't have to fear that storm. That storm's already come. It's already come. We, We hide in Christ. Isaiah chapter 4. That day is now. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the for the declaration of your mercy and your grace towards Jerusalem. We're thankful that you've caused some to escape. Lord, we pray that you would cause us now to believe what you've said and to flee in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we ask it. Amen. Brother Tom, number 514 in the hardback hymnal. Let's stand together.
come with me that love of the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord, join in a song with sweet accord, and thus around the throne, and thus around the throne. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion, we're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God, but children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King may speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. The hill of Zion yields a thousand sacred sweets. Before we reach the heavenly fields, before we reach the heavenly fields, or walk the golden streets, or walk the golden streets. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God.